on Zoom. This is the I'm being recorded. This is the, this is the most on time meeting we've ever started. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to thank a few people for making this evening a reality. So first of all, David Mendel, our CEO here at OL, for agreeing to host this event, for always ensuring um, that OL is really at the forefront of the mental health needs of the firm community. Um, and so that's a big thing. I want to thank Mississippi Riders, so OL's Director of Trauma and Clinical Services, who really this evening is her vision. Um, and Dr. Chaim Newhoff, who's hiding in the back, as usual, who really pulled together the pieces to make it happen. Um, I also want to thank, thank Susan Hollander, our clinical director here at TICFA, for managing a lot of the details, uh, Teresa Aguilar, Laura Bart, the IT department, and all the rest of our office staff. I'm sorry if I didn't get you by name, but for taking care of the details. Um, so I don't know that in my career in mental health so far um, that I've ever seen a single publication or book that sort of created the kind of waves uh, that Bad Therapy by, um, by Abigail Schreier has has sort of created. Um, it's gotten a lot of attention, positive and negative in the media, um, like really an astounding amount of attention. I think I've seen no less than three articles on the topic in like a, a, a 30 day period, just in the Orthodox Jewish media. Uh, the listeners I'm on have unbelievable amounts of, of screen space devoted to bashing the book. <laughs> and I think the Equally astounding, I guess, to the amount of media attention has been the defensiveness of many in the in the psychology world um, on that react, you know, to, to many of the things in the book. Um, but it's undeniable that I think that it's sort of it's it's hit a nerve with the layman, uh, with the average person on the street, right? There's there's something that resonated with the general population. Um, and there's something that they're looking at, they're reading this book and they're saying, we, we agree with something here, right? There may be something wrong. And so for us to sit in denial and say, the book is you know, just another rag to throw out, I think would be silly. Um, and it would sort of be putting our heads in the sand and you know, make us sort of almost hypocritical in a way and unwilling to look at ourselves honestly. Um, and that's not to say that everything it says is right or wrong. I think it's just important for us to look at ourselves from another perspective. So there's a lot of cogent books, points in the book, right? The importance of including parents in a child's treatment team, focusing on resilience um, rather than victimhood when we, when we do therapy, using evidence-based models to help people get better rather than just sort of open-ended talk therapy that doesn't necessarily go anywhere. These, those principles, I can say with confidence, are central to what I think we all believe in our, as therapists and certainly what we believe in here at OHEL. Um, and we certainly believe in the value of therapy and therapists in general. So by the way, we, we have openings if you're a therapist that shares that value. Um, with that perspective, I'm going to introduce Moshe Norman, ask him to introduce our panel for tonight. And they'll be discussing some of the more nuanced issues presented in the book. So our moderator for tonight really needs no intro, but we're gonna do one anyways. So Moshe is the founder and host of the extremely popular Mondays with Moshe, also the host of the Tuesdays with Moshe, which is less known, has over 1,000 members, many of whom tune in on a weekly basis for his interviews. He's also the founder and director of Transcend Counseling based in Lakewood, New Jersey. He practices psychotherapy with individuals and families and recently launched a new experiential therapy program for young married couples. Moshe will be our brave moderator. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Yoshua. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Good evening. Yes, um, bad therapy is uh, the latest rave in the community. It's been written by somebody by the name of Abigail Schreier, who is a journalist. And it's a true honor to have been invited to moderate tonight's discussion on her book, Bad Therapy, Why Kids Aren't Growing Up. Before I introduce our panelists, allow me to indulge in an introduction to tonight's topic. Over the past several months, Schreier's sensational book has made great waves in the world of parenting and in the world of therapy. Admittedly, she is quite a talented and compelling writer. In reading her book and watching some interviews, I found myself particularly bewildered by her many misrepresentations of both who benefits from therapy as well as how the therapeutic process works to heal our patients. 
No, therapy is not and has never been about venting, complaining, or fetching to a rent a friend who takes your hard earned money for a 50 minute hour and then seductively convinces the compliant Miss Goody Two Shoes to return for as many sessions as the therapist can squeeze out of her, as Ms. Schreier described her own experience in therapy. By and large, our patients struggle from real debilitating pain and are desperate for some relief by the time they enter therapy. However, I did find legitimacy in some of her claims with regards to our treatment of children in today's generation, namely the overuses of gentle parenting, over accommodation, and the general attitudes towards coddling children. We have reached a point where virtually every kid has their needs accommodated in the spirit of equality and have left almost no room for the development of resilience. Notwithstanding my initial aversion to her claims, Schreier has also created some room for us therapists to reflect and ask ourselves the following. Are we always engaging in best practice with our clients? Would we be pushing our clients away from therapy and helping them acknowledge that adversity is a healthy part of living that engenders resilience? Is the weekly remuneration our clients provide blinding us from helping them move towards termination? Is our work in fact fraught with iatrogenesis, as she claims? I practiced a long time pronouncing that one. <laughs> Specifically with regards to children, we need to ask ourselves, how many of the children we treat actually need to be in therapy to begin with? Are we generating problems by feeding negative emotions to our youth? In a number of striking anecdotes, Abigail notes how nurses and mental health professionals actually <clears throat> induce and cultivate otherwise unheard of ideas into the minds of our innocent youth. Have you recently had any thoughts to hurt yourself? Already readily asked to children who come to the doctor's office for a routine throat culture indicating, let's make problems. Indeed, this is scary. In perhaps a more contentious argument, Schreier takes the idea of childhood trauma to, ask, to task in a big way. She argues that what has been labeled trauma or adverse childhood experiences, ACE, are simply common forms of adversity that, will, that humans require to develop a basic resiliency. In some cases, she may be correct, but in many others, she is wrong. While many of her points are well taken, Schreier distastefully minimizes some of the emotional challenges that children face that actually permanently inhibit their ability to function as children and later as adults. She says they should simply get over it. Having met thr throngs of youth and adults who have struggled with acute anxieties and depression and other forms of pathology, we therapists know good and well that nobody can su succeed by telling them to get over it in any form. Just because, just because previous generations did not have therapy, that does not mean that our ancestors did not commit suicide, struggle with addiction and abuse, and abuse their family members. Those who suffer with a chronic sense of worthlessness have been impacted from the subliminal childhood messages implying that they are in some way bad, inferior, or valued only for the benefits they bring towards their parents. These deep-rooted experience have become so embedded in them that they need an entire new parenting experience, one that is laden with trust, respect, compassion, listening, and the many other gradual techniques that cultivate self-esteem. Only then can, they, can many of our patients begin to thrive. Nevertheless, Schreier is correct that many parents could save themselves a lot of grief if they would adopt a par parenting approach that includes more aggressive faith in their child's abilities, and one which can make more demands and has greater expectations. Kids can do it, but Schreier puts us in a bind. On the one hand, she advocates for stronger parenting. Parents should not be afraid of their children. On the other hand, she is against the therapy that empowers those very parents to raise their children. It is this point that will hopefully garner some attention tonight among our panelists. My hope is that we will be able to utilize the time to come to something conclusive and productive that in, in Abigail Schreier's merit will enable us to produce healthy, resilient children in the 21st century. And boy, do we need it. 
So I'd like to introduce our panelists for tonight. First, we have on my right, Dr. Camilo Ortiz, who is the Director of Clinical Training and Associate Professor of Psychology at LIU CW Post. Dr. Ortiz conducts research on parenting, disruptive, disruptive behavior, problems in children, elimination disorders, and cognitive behavior therapy for child and adult psychiatric disorders. Dr. Ortiz is a licensed psychologist in New York State and has made a number of media appearances to bring evidence-based clinical psychology to a broader audience. Welcome. Next to Dr. Ortiz is Dr. Tali Wygod, who is a psychologist in a clinical psychologist who specializes in the treatment of children, adolescents, and families. Dr. Wygod is a certified PCIT clinician with gold standard evidence-based treatment for young children with behavior problems. Dr. Wygott is also a board certified DBT clinician. Does everyone know what that stands for? DBT? Okay. And evidence-based treatment for emotion dysregulation in children, teens, and adults. In addition to providing therapy, she also conducts trainings in schools, consults with various school districts, and conducts research. Dr. Wygott recently published two papers in peer-reviewed journals about the treatment of young children and working with their parents. Razel Kielsen is a licensed clinical social worker and has been working with children and families for 15 years. Razel is the clinical supervisor of OHIL's Early Childhood Mental Health Treatment Center and clinical director of Children's Services at OHIL's Outpatient Mental Health Clinic. Okay, so those are our three panelists. And let's get to the discussion. So Dr. Ortiz, if it's okay, um, would you start off and uh, give us an introduction? Can I use it? Sure. You want to take this up? Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Uh, so I'd like to thank Dr. Newhoff um, for inviting me to discuss some uh, potentially controversial topics, but that's okay. Uh, I want to make clear that while I'm featured in the book and uh, I consider Abigail Schreier a friend, I have no financial interest in the book or in anything else that she does. When I read Bad Therapy, I was reminded of the first line of Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. It was the worst of times. It was the best of times. I'll take them in, in reverse order. So demand for our services has never been greater. Most therapists in private practice have waiting lists. We have more influence on society than ever. These are truly the best of times for us. We all know that this demand comes from an unprecedented pandemic of anxiety and loneliness, the worst of times. To make matters worse, I think we are squandering this historical moment. Much of what we do is weak or inert, some of what we do is harmful. If we do not course correct, and I think that we can, we will experience a loss of public confidence in our field, just as academia has. There are many parallels there, and I wish we had more time to discuss it in more detail. But briefly, both academia and the mental health field were overconfident, had little competition, and projected an air of righteousness. Higher ed is beginning to pay a price for this, and I hope that we can avoid that. The book, Bad Therapy, has flaws, including an over-reliance on anecdotal evidence, somewhat inflammatory language, and a mischaracterization of certain aspects of therapy. However, it may be the most important book about our field in the last 10 years, because it highlights several widespread practices that have a strong potential to be harmful to our patients and to society. While uncomfortable, if we are to advance as a field, we must look inward and have conversations about whether what we are doing is working, consistent with evidence-based practice and ethical. When I was a first year doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, one of my professors assigned a book to the class called House of Cards by Robin Dawes. It ruined my first semester. It turned my optimism about the field into a deep fear that largely what we do is ineffective and unscientific. 
The book explained using high quality data that more experience as a therapist doesn't make you better. In fact, we tend to peak about two years postdoc. Psychologists are no better at predicting things like patient outcomes and chance. And what he called new age psychology and its heavy reliance on feelings and self-esteem was ruining the field. The last one is quite similar to what Schreier writes about in, in that therapy. Just as I hope today's discussion goes, the message I eventually took from Da's book is that if we are aware of these problems and work hard to counteract them, we can make tremendous difference in people's lives. So getting back to bad therapy, here are two things that Schreier shines a light on that I hope we can have a discussion about tonight. The first one is that therapy can harm what is called iatrogenesis. Can I get a show of hands? In your graduate training, how many of you spent a significant amount of time discussing the science and data on iatrogenic effects of therapy? Anybody? Okay. How many of you have it in your consent forms that there is a chance that a client will get worse because of the therapy they're about to get? Two, okay. So studies show that between five and 20% of people get worse because of the therapy that they undertake. It strikes me as bizarre and conveniently self-serving that we don't talk about this. What if you were about to take a medication that had a one in five chance of making you worse? Wouldn't you wanna know about that? So why do so many of us think that the worst thing therapy can do is just not make us better? Bad therapy has done our field a huge favor by highlighting this because reasonable steps, which I will discuss shortly, are so easy to take. The second point that Schreier makes is that what she calls therapy culture has spread into other areas such as schools, parenting, and the workplace with negative effects. What started with the best of intentions as a reaction against authoritarian parenting, invalidation and physical punishment has been taken largely by people with little psychological or ethics training and turned into what can be a harmful approach to parenting and teaching. Regarding therapy culture in schools, she writes that schools are encouraging therapy often in school with untrained paraprofessionals who have little understanding of the dangers of dual relationships, iatrogenesis and overdiagnosis. This often leaves parents excluded when they are told, often with a great degree of certainty that their child needs services. Social emotional learning programs have replaced classroom instruction. Assessments are made with little training and treatment is suggested too quickly, sometimes without parental knowledge and often in defiance of best practices. For example, routine in-school assessments highlight normal negative emotions in children, bringing their attention to them and likely making them worse. In the parenting realm, which is where I do most of my work, therapists and everyone from TikTok influencers to life coaches are pushing different versions of gentle parenting, which often has heavy doses of permissiveness. 50 years of data have demonstrated that while overreactive parenting is bad for kids, so is the other extreme, permissiveness. A misunderstanding of behavioral science has led these hired experts to confidently instruct parents to delete punishment uh, from their repertoire and to look for the underlying causes of child misbehavior from an overreactive fight flight response to disorders with little evidence, such as pathological demand avoidance and sensory processing disorders. In short, we see what Schreier calls a professionalization of parenting, which can lead to a devaluation of parents and grandparents. In effect, we have cast aside what we know works well, which is firm rules with consequences, unconditional love, encouraging independence, and giving kids lots of practice with what I like to call the four Ds, discomfort, disappointment, distress, and mild danger. The result is that children are viewed as fragile by many therapists 
teachers and parents, which is exactly backwards. Are you as discouraged as I was as a first year doctoral student? Well, here's where I give you the good news. There are multiple ways that we can practice good therapy that increases the beneficial effects of what we do. So I'm gonna talk about the two areas. And for the first area, the iatrogenic effects, I'll give you four ideas. Number one, warn clients that therapy can make them worse and then look out for it. This means using objective, frequent measurements of outcome and paying close attention to deterioration and beware of convenience for the therapist solutions to deterioration like, I guess the client needs more therapy. Number two, liberal use of watchful waiting so that we give people a chance to heal on their own before we get involved. Have you noticed that when people make an appointment about a month away, they often call right before the appointment and say, you know what, I think I'm not gonna need to come in. So that's giving people a chance for the normal variations of their symptoms and of mood to come back to uh, a reasonable state. Number three, be slow to interpret behavior as pathological. Much of the harm of therapy comes from jumping to conclusions about the seriousness of behavior. I had a client last week who told me that their child's withholding of bowel movements was according to their therapist, a sure sign of sexual abuse. This is not even in the top 10 reasons why kids would withhold bowel movements. This is an extreme example, but many others come to mind. The correct explanation for behavior is often quite simple. In this case, it hurt to poop, so the child decided he wasn't gonna poop anymore. There is often no deeper explanation and looking for one can mislead. Relatedly, kids don't need a therapist because they're sad for a week or because they stayed out past curfew one time. Happiness is statistically rare and disobeying an occasional rule is the way for kids to figure out where real boundaries are. Number four, be aware of pseudoscientific therapies that have been proven to harm. Any work by Scott Lillianfeld is a great place to start in this area. With respect to the second problem, the intrusion of therapy culture into schools and parenting, I have just a couple of suggestions. Number one, refocus on parenting work, less individual child work. One of the reasons Schreier argues that individual psychotherapy with children is the most likely to harm is the huge power imbalance between an adult therapist and a child client. You minimize this by working with parents. A focus on parents is entirely consistent with the empirical evidence on effective treatments for child problems, which generally shows, especially for young kids, that parent training is the most effective use of your time. I can't tell you how often I get a call where the presenting problem is, my child has big emotions and meltdowns. They want their child, sometimes as young as four, to be in individual therapy with me. Almost always, after a clinical interview with parents, I find that they are accidentally reinforcing big displays of emotion and tantrums with endless reasoning, validation, and reassurance. Simple instruction in a kind but firm response. I'm happy to discuss a play date with you later this week, but I can't if you're yelling at me. Miraculously leads children who have been described as incapable of regulating their emotions to speak calmly. Number two, get trained in strength-based approaches that seek to get kids out of therapy as soon as possible. Here's my one plug. I developed independence therapy for anxious children. Five sessions, free treatment manual, focus on letting kids do things independently without parents, without a therapist, outside of the office, so that they learn that they are capable and resilient. Preliminary evidence shows it to be quite effective. I hope the points I've made lead to questions, thoughts, and even a little disagreement as we work through these challenging and complex issues. Thank you. Well, thank you for those uh, wonderful and insightful opening remarks. Um, Dr. Tali Flygod, please.
Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, a little bit about me is I'm a DBT therapist. Hopefully you guys know what that stands for by now. Uh, dialectical behavior therapy. So at my core, whenever I'm reading something, I'm always looking for the dialectic, which means that two opposing things can both be true at the same time. So when I was reading this book, I noticed myself on the one hand feeling extremely judgmental of the therapist that she was describing, the therapy that was being conducted that she was recording, and, uh, and what's going on in school from her perspective. And on the other hand, as a parent of three young children, finding myself really identifying with the way that she was describing parenting trends right now, which made me take a big look in the mirror, and be like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And when I thought about that dialectic, the way that I kind of resolved that was this idea that adults, whether it be therapists, parents, school-based professionals, are really fragilizing children. We're removing their ability to tolerate any emotions and what I like to call making them distress intolerant. They essentially can't tolerate any feelings, any hardship, which is doing them a disservice, which is why I think the children aren't growing up, as she talks about. So many young adults can't function, can't do anything. I heard a statistic recently that I think it was like over 50% of 22-year-olds bring a parent with them to a job interview. That's really alarming. It's really alarming. So I want to talk about the ways in which uh, this, this core, this fragilizing of children kind of pervades the way that she describes therapy, the way that she describes school-based uh, intervention, and also the way that she describes parenting. So the first thing in therapy. So when she's going through, I think it's like her 10 steps, her recipe to bad therapy, um, one of the steps is to accommodate and affirm childhood emotions. So for example, she talks about how if a kid is, is displaying anxiety about dogs, for example, if you're about dogs, if you're about public speaking, a way to do bad therapy is to affirm, accommodate, validate that feeling. And I found that to be so uh, antithetical to everything that I know about therapy and everything about the way that I think about doing therapy that it felt so alarming to me that that's what she was saying so many people are doing. So I think the first step to keep in mind is that in order to not do bad therapy, we have to really make sure that we're not over accommodating child, children's emotions. So what does that look like? So again, to go back to my DBT roots, it's to validate what's valid. So for example, I have, as I mentioned, I have three kids. They're all pretty much terrified of dogs um, and no surprise, so is my husband. Right, so it makes sense that my kids are really scared of dogs because their dad crosses the street when a dog comes by. Don't worry, we're working on it. Uh, crosses the street when a dog comes, refuses to pet dogs. Like that makes so much sense. And dogs are not inherently dangerous. So we need to make sure that we're validating the valid, and not accommodating a fear that's not actually accurate. So that's the first part when it comes to therapy: how to actually do more effective therapy. The other thing I want to mention about um, incorporating parents into therapy, which I think we're going to talk about more, is I find in my work as a, ther as a child therapist, so many parents want to do what we call the dry cleaning method. We drop our children up, off, we pick them up when they're clean, right? That's not how this works. Therapy can't really happen in a vacuum, especially if you're six, seven, eight, even 10. You really need to address what's going on at home, as Dr. Ortiz said. The second thing when it comes to school-based intervention. So how are we over accommodating children in school? I think we could probably come up with a million reasons, a million ways in which this is happening. But I think that so many, so much of my work in schools, when I go in, I end up really teaching and orienting uh, school-based professionals to how they might be accidentally contributing to the problem. And, and when we have a child who is getting dysregulated in class, maybe throwing something, cursing at a teacher, and then they leave class, what are we doing? We're basically teaching them, okay, when you do this, you get to spend an hour in the counselor's office. So we have to really work on not accommodating what doesn't need to be accommodated and what shouldn't be accommodated and reinforced. And then the last thing when it comes to parenting. So as I said, a parent of three kids, and I see in myself, it is so hard to make my kids upset to hold the limit, to force them to feel distress, to feel that shame when they hit their brother or flush a flashlight down the toilet, all real things that happen. 
And that's how they learn. I think that our job as parents and people who are working with parents, we have to train children what is effective, appropriate behavior. And if we're, do, if we're not allowing them to feel any distress, how are you gonna learn? When I recently got pulled over and had to get a, part, and a speeding ticket, which was such a nightmare, so many points for my driver's license, that feeling of shame and regret and you know, feeling of wasting money, that's what's gonna keep me following the speed limit. And that's exactly what we need to do and train parents to do to their kids. And I think another thing that she does in the book is she's really conflating parenting experts with what we know as the evidence-based parenting intervention. So for example, when she's talking about parenting experts, like the gentle parenting experts, I believe that she's referring to anybody who can kind of sing a shingle and say that they're a parenting expert, whether it's on Instagram or TikTok or any um, public forum like that. And when I think about parenting experts, I'm not thinking about, no offense, Dr. Becky. I'm thinking about the, the seminal authors who wrote about what's going to work, what's going to actually lead to effective behavior change at home. Like has been Patterson, Forham, these are the people who really did the work to, you know, pave the way for parenting networks. So again, when I'm reading this book, I'm thinking a lot about how society as a whole has leaned so heavily to accommodate and fragilize children. And I hope that we can take away from that the ways in which that is really harmful and be really, really cognizant of how we might have to be contributing to that and also helping parents do that also. Okay, thank you very much for those words. Uh, Razel Kielsen, please. But I'm gonna do the brief one because I know we're excited to get into this. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about parents bringing their children to therapy. And I think when parents come to us, they're wondering, will therapy make my child better? Am I not enough to make my child better? Is my child so messed up that I need a professional to help them? Will the therapist blame me? Am I really the cause of all the things that are a matter with my child? Am I giving up my right to nurture and make decisions for my child? And I think these are some of the questions the book is really stirring up with parents. And they're wondering, what is going on in therapy? What am I giving up? And I think as therapists, we need to honestly be able to answer those questions. Are we marginalizing parents? or are we including them in the process? Do we see the value of the parent-child relationship? Do we know how to navigate a parent who seems to be undermining the process? How many of you have met the parent who doesn't believe, right? Like there's like some sort of belief system about there, doesn't believe in treatment. Do we know how to work with these parents? Because it is so easy for us, and I, I'm a, I practice child parent psychotherapy, and one of our tenants are, do not be the better parents in the room because it is so easy to be the better parent. We are playful. We're giving positive, unconditional regard. We're not really setting limits. I, I guess it depends on your style, but a lot of us aren't. And by doing that, we can sort of lean into this parent's belief that they are not enough. They are part of the problem. We know how to do it better. And then we're missing out on the most important, impactful relationship and really where I think change can happen is in that parent-child relationship that it's hard sometimes to work with these parents. It's hard to see maybe some of the choices they've made that impacted their, their child. But that's where the real magic in therapy can happen if we can heal this parent-child relationship. So I'm really hoping today we can talk a little bit about including parents in the treatment process. And I think something that the book a little bit touches on, but it's something we really owe it to our clients to think about. Thank you. The idea of tonight's discussion is really to uh, encourage participation from those in the audience, including those of you who are watching virtually. So I'd like to hear questions from the audience. If you have any questions or comments on any of the content that was shared thus far in the past 30 or 35 minutes from Dr. Ortiz, Tali, Razel, um, or myself, then please raise your hand and we'll take the question. Um, while you think of your questions, I'd like to pose the following question. 
many of you know that I run a podcast or a show called Mondays with Moshe on Monday nights, and I interview uh, experts in the mental health field uh, from all over the world, from the spectrum of mental health. Uh, over the past number of weeks, I happen to have had a number of child-centered play therapists, including Risa Van Fleet, who is child-centered play therapy, Brenna Hicks, who is a big child therapist and podcaster, and uh, Lisa Dion. Th there seems to be value and merit to the concept that they shared of child-centered play therapy, which does not necessarily include parents. I'm not even sure if it includes parents at all. But in child-centered play therapy, what they are doing is working with a child who is struggling, uh, who may be struggling with their emotions because of big T trauma, small T trauma, or no trauma at all, maybe just emotional regulation. It's not to say that the therapists don't believe, per se, or necessarily, that the parents aren't capable. And in some cases and instances, the parents, in fact, aren't capable. And in some cases, there are no parents. What are your thoughts as to something like child-centered play therapy, which actually works in a very Jungian fashion and allows the child to sort of self-repair and self-heal? Is that something that you believe has room for in our field or not? Okay, so one of the therapies that I specialize in is called parent-child interaction therapy. And what you do in PCIT is you're essentially teaching parents play therapy strategies. And oftentimes I get parents uh, as referrals who want play therapy because they want to, as I said earlier, just kind of drop off their kid. And what I say to them is, what benefit would it have you if I form a really great relationship with your child? I'm going to spend tops 45 minutes with them. You're going to spend a lifetime with them. So I believe that teaching parents the play therapy principles is actually where we would have the most benefit and where actually the research suggests that we have the most benefit. UCIT is highly effective. Um, even I think just one session alone is, is, is more effective than some other interventions. So I think that play therapy has a space in the sense that teaching the tools to parents so that they can do it at home. So in the work um, we do here at OHEL with Child Parent Psychotherapy, we sometimes do not have the opportunity for the parent to be in the room because the parent might be incarcerated or the parent might have passed away or the parent, there are a lot of reasons and they can't always be here. What does it mean to have a parent in the room who's not physically in the room? I think that can maybe give you an idea of when I'm sitting with a child and the parent cannot be there because maybe they're in prison. I'm not working and just saying, I'm going to become the better parent or I'm going to hear your story. Yes, I'm doing some of that. And yes, I'm allowing them to show me some of their process, but I'm holding that parent in my head. Oh, let me end the parent who won't come in, right? Who says, I don't need this. I don't believe what my wife wants to. I don't, I don't mean to cast any gender, but sometimes that's how it comes up. My wife wants to bring them and I'm okay with it, but please, I don't, I don't want to do any of this crazy therapy stuff. I am holding that father or whoever that person is in my head in the work I do. And I'm thinking about where is that relationship with the child? So you don't need to be in the room to be in the room. And that's really, I think the value of, yes, you can do child. I, I'm not a child uh, directive uh, play therapist, but I do work directly with children. I do love to work in, with the system of the parent, but I'm okay. I think we can do good work with a child alone, as long as we remember there's someone important who's not here. How would this land if they were? What is their perspective that's important? So every, every semester I challenge my doctoral students to find me the best evidence they can that play therapy is effective. And I've been making this challenge for many years, and I have yet to get good evidence. I am totally open to the possibility that for some problems it is. The, the, the main uh, situation where I get a little frustrated with it is when I see that it's being used for something that we have a really good treatment for instead. And so an example of that is noncompliance and defiance in children. If you understand the case conceptualization of why that happens, it usually centers on Patterson's coercive cycle. 
And the course of cycle, I want to try to not be too professorial here, but it's pretty simple, which is that parents inadvertently reinforce misbehavior in their kids by saying no, and when kids escalate, giving in. And kids escalate, uh, uh, sorry, kids reinforce the worst behavior in parents by only listening when their parents yell and scream. And so you have both people sort of making the other person the worst version of themselves. And play therapy, in, in no way that I'm aware of, tries to disrupt the course of cycle. So um, I'm, I'm open to the possibility that there are good applications of play therapy, but I often see it used for things for which parent training is uh, an excellent solution and, and similar problems like that. So that, that's my thought on play therapy. So it's, it seems that conclusively, we pretty much all would agree that there can be a place for something such as or similar to child center play therapy when rendered necessary or the alternatives are not available. I would just add that I, I like Tali's answer because teaching parents these techniques is going to be far more effective. Yes. And I have this talk three times a week with people who call me. As you said, I'm going to be around your child 45 minutes. You're going to be around them 184 hours a week. Which do we think would be more effective? But, but would you agree that there may be some situations that the average parent is not equipped to deal with, such as big T traumas, great uh, natural disasters or whatnot? that the average parent cannot navigate without professional intervention. I, I would agree with that. I'm just not sure play therapy is the most effective way to teach parents to do that. Maybe you guys disagree. <laughs> well, that's kind of what we do. <laughs> um, definitely with trauma work, our goal, and again, I'm not, uh, the trauma work that I do is parent-child and it is in play. And our theory uh, which, by the way, CPP is an evidence-based and recognized by the National Institute for Trauma as an effective treatment for uh, trauma in children zero to five. Um, really, our work is around being a facilitator of communication between the child who experienced a rupture in their attachment because they experienced a trauma. And, and what we understand from zero to five trauma is that uh, primarily it lives in the attachment relationship of I wasn't, you didn't, weren't able to keep me safe. And therefore the world is not safe. So we really do the work through play of retelling stories, but we help the parent see and give them opportunities. We're kind of like this interpreter. That's really how we describe it. Help the parent take the opportunity, help them regulate to respond appropriately to what the child saying, hey, this really bad, awful thing happened to me. So we're kind of like interpreters, but it, it definitely happens through play because I think that's children's language. That's how they speak to us. And actually children do this in the real world too. Like you don't, Something that I think is important to acknowledge as therapists is that therapy is not the only way to heal. That children play things out all the time to make sense. Um, and they don't necessarily need a therapist, but sometimes the symptoms are so impactful that they do need a therapist to help with this play process. Thank you. Question in the back? Helen, you had a question? Yes. Um, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Ellen. Okay. Thank you. And greetings from Nashville. Um, thank you for having this discussion. Um, I'm a clinician at a group practice here, and this book was just very eye-opening for me. Um, mostly what I am curious about um, from any of you who wants to answer is uh, the notion of uh, the body keeps the score and, uh, you know, that book is, has been a bestseller for many, many, many months and I believe that it is feeding into what she calls a trauma culture. Um, and I was so curious what your thoughts are about that. I haven't read the book from my understanding of it. It's based on a whole bunch of pseudoscience that our muscles and outside of our central nervous system 
uh, remember trauma and can even pass it on to our children. That on the face of it seems silly to me. I, I don't know uh, what else I can say about the book not having read it, but it is consistent with this idea that, that Abigail talks about that trauma lives everywhere and we have to be super careful and we can't tolerate things not going our way or even things more serious than that. Um, uh, so it, it might be the best example of a, a wider cultural trend that we have seen. Right, thank you. Can I just respond to that? Uh, I think that it's evident from reports of our clients and patients that the body does keep the score. And um, it may, you may say that it's pseudoscience or not, but all of us know that those who've suffered sexual trauma struggle with sexual performance in the bedroom. We know that their bodies shut down and the body remembers things that happen in trauma. So um, I'm curious as to your thoughts as to you know, the pseudoscience and the non-truthness of it. So I, I think we actually agree about that. Um, from what I hear, what you're saying, these are mediated by the central nervous system. We have memories, we have uh, reactions to things. I think the thesis of the book is that these same processes live outside of the central nervous system in muscles, in bones, and, and other things like that. So uh, uh, clearly, if someone's been traumatized, they're going to have a reaction to similar stimuli that were around. This, this is the basis of a post-traumatic reaction. So no disagreement there. Uh, uh, my contention is that that occurs in the central nervous system. I think, I think also another thing that I took away from, her, from Abigail's presentation of that book was that the, the idea that you can have trauma around memories that you don't even remember. So she talks a lot about his, his theory on repressed memories. And I, I, I also haven't read the book. Um, and I've had a lot of patients talk about, bring this book up when they're coming for trauma treatment. And I think that it, it's, it's something to be really cautious about, really cautious about this idea that you can have this, you know, your, your, I think she talked about like your back could be hurting. And so that means you were abused as a child or that could mean you were abused as a child. And I don't, I don't think that that's legitimate or fair to, you know, trauma and also people and using that as support for memories and traumatic events. You don't, you're not even conscious of. I'll just add one little piece, which is we, we tend to have like a really short memory in our field. So the repressed memory era was the most shameful thing that occurred in our field probably in the last 80 years. And so what I hear when, when I hear things like the body keeps score is just a different flavor of the same thing. You don't know if you were traumatized, but it's in there and we need to find it. I get super concerned about therapy having that role. <laughs> I, have a question. I, I actually like the brain that changes itself which i think was before the body keeps square i think that's an excellent book he talks a lot about neuroplasticity which is really amazing stuff our brains and our bodies are really designed to help us stay safe and sometimes that system doesn't work well which is like a big theory of the book um just because it's trying its best to keep us safe and that this awful thing should never happen again so we're gonna react in a way that the mind knows, I'm not there, this is not that person, but the body still reacts like that. And I mean, who, who doesn't see patients like this, right? They say, I know this person is not my father, and then they still react, right? And, and you can tell them this as much as they want, but a lot of it lives with, with inside the way their body reacts. Um, I think that's like a big premise of the book, the neuroplasticity, the changing of the brain. And the good news is that it goes the other way too, right? We know that you're not stuck and set. If you've experienced a trauma, um, we can heal. And there's great healing in approaching it in a cognitive way, TFCBT. And there's also great healing we now know about, right, with sensory motor and other types of uh, treatments that come at it more at a body-based intervention than a more cognitive. Well, I read the uh, oh, short I version. On the okay. I read the primer. Can I ask a question? Go ahead. Yes, I think, Dr. Yeah, I would like just to, to 
I think this, this points to really a, a broader question, which I find is um, sometimes um, interventions really that people come out from, from a, a research base to make a decision if an intervention is effective or not. And interventions like, you know, those of Andrew Koch and others, it comes more from really, there are many, I run trainings, I see there are many uh, clinicians who run for these trainings and these are smart people and their evidence is not coming from a standard research-based evidence, but more from a, a just what's, what they're finding is effective within the, the, the office. And I wonder if this could comment if there's any validity to uh, you know that approach to conducting therapy based on what you find works in the in the you know, in the offices. So one of the things that that I have been interested in a, in a long time is how how we fool ourselves into thinking things. And uh, there's a famous quote, and I'm forgetting who said it, but something like. It's easy to fool people, and the easiest person to fool is yourself. And and I was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was reading an article by Scott Lilienfeld, who I mentioned before. And in this article, he describes twenty seven ways that patients can appear to be improving, and they actually are not. And so the literature on how easy it is to misunderstand human behavior is, is a long literature, and it's a deep literature. And so that's why we need highly rigorous randomized controlled trials, because if without that stuff, it's just our, our minds search for patterns. And so we are so easy to fool. And, and the people, as I mentioned before, people who are trained in this field, therapists, are actually not any better at predicting things than, than flipping a coin. And, and that also demonstrates the hubris that a lot of people in our field have. And an interesting finding is when you ask therapists, are you a better than average therapist? Something like 97% say yes. That is statistically impossible. And so we have to have sort of guardrails in place to protect ourselves from what we all are subject to, which is spotting patterns that don't actually exist or believing that we are better than we are. And that's why you know, as, as frustrating and long as it takes to do research studies, we really need to be basing what we're doing on that. At the same time, we certainly can generate hypotheses from our clinical experience. Every good idea I ever had that turned out to be uh, validated by research started with a patient in the room and me thinking, hey, maybe this works. But that can't be all that we do. The thought that I'm having is when I... Um... I'm supervising doctoral students and, and providing supervision and training them. I'm often teaching them how to be the expert and, and kind of um, feel more confident. And one of the things that I, I often say to them is, what do you think a medical doctor would say, right? If your patient is constantly asking you to reschedule, would your pediatrician be that accommodating? And the answer is often no. So uh, to your question, what I was thinking about was, what if medical doctors did that? What if a surgeon said, I'm going to do what sometimes works, what feels like it works, even though we have so much research and evidence about how to actually perform surgery, how would you respond to that? So that, that's what I'm thinking about, right? Why does, why does psychology and social science in this way have to be so different? Um, and we need, I think we really need to hold ourselves to, to high standards to ensure the future of this field. I, I definitely agree that we can't just go on gut. I think we, there's a lot of information out there and a lot of research. I, the one thing that I have a hard time with is when I see studies, you know, if you wanna be part of a study for anxiety treatment, you have to only have anxiety. But how many of our clients are like, I mean, it's anxiety, but you know, this happened and also this is happening and we were homeless and, you know, they would never get into the study. So I think our field struggles to be exactly like a medical field, like exactly like how you practice medicine, you should practice um, the behavioral health and mental health science because just because you saw one medical trauma does not mean you've seen them all. And this I actually think is how we could talk about bad therapy. If you think that, if you think, well, I, I, I met someone with early childhood sexual abuse, I know what that looks like. No, you got to have humility and recognize each person who comes into the room 
has their own experience, their own background. And yes, leaning on science and evidence, but we need to tailor the treatment for that family sitting right in front of me. If I could just ask a follow-up to that. Can we acknowledge for a moment that psychology is somewhat of a soft science? And the fact that we are not the same as surgeons because so much of it is sort of based on what we think. And if you look at the evidence-based models, whether it's Marsha Linehan, Richard Schwartz, um, Sue Johnson, if you go to any of their lectures, you're gonna hear that they were doing what worked for them and then turned it into a model and researched it, right? And so why would I, as a therapist, not do the same thing? Do what seems to be working for me, and if I have the time and the students to research it for me, I'll do it. And if I don't, I'll keep doing what works for me. Right, because at the end of the day, it really is a soft science. So I'm, I'm a little bit playing devil's advocate, but I think it's a point that has to be acknowledged. Yes, I should acknowledge it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for highlighting the other side. I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, on the one hand, we want to treat psychotherapy and therapy and treatment of mental health to the same standard. And it's also not the same. It's kind of like you can't sell your psychotherapy practice. You're the product. You're, you're the tool. It's not like a patient list that you're, you know, doing cavities and root canals on. So I think that when I, when I think about this, I feel like it's a lot about doing the principles that work in, in your way, right? The way that I'm going to treat somebody and the way that therapy looks like with me might not be the same way as other two people up here. And as long as we're keeping in mind the principles that work, I think that that's really how we can stay true to the, the science and the research that so many people before us have spent doing. I'll just add that I think we're giving physicians way too much credit. Uh, medicine is filled with pseudoscience. Okay, any, any other questions from the audience? Zoom has a whole bunch. You want them? Let's zoom right over. Okay, let's start with Shmuel. Um, Hi, can you ahead. hear me? Yes. My question is really is what, what is the practical suggestion in making it more like um, real medicine? Cholesterol, high cholesterol is high cholesterol, whether you're sitting in New York, Israel, or California. Um, emotional stress is different in each location. And I think that uh, our work is much more an art than actually a science. And it's about becoming a good artist and not so much as a, about a, a good scientist. Yeah, I think um, Shmuel is, is um, bringing up the, the um, discussion of the different kinds of therapies, the more evidence-based concrete therapies versus the more dynamic analytic-based therapies. And, you know, it's actually something that was... Uh, I guess, hovering in my mind as this discussion carried on. It, you know, in so many, for so many clinician or, or clinical orientations or clinician orientations, or orientations such as myself, I'm a dynamic-based or um, insight-oriented therapist. Um, so much of what's happening is intuitive and based on the intuition and based on the relationship and in, in the healing parts of the relationship and not necessarily in something that's as concrete and measurable. And even success itself may be difficult to measure because what seems to be a success for some may often be a non-success to, some, to someone else. For, you know, a classic example that I always give is uh, um, the conundrum that we are in when we do behavioral therapies. So if we tell a client to do something, right? So we may be helping them, let's just say, with exposure. But we also may be reenacting dependence. So that client but that person may have, as a child, been very, very dependent on his parents or on his authority members or his significant others, and we are actually reenacting that very dependence by telling them what to do. Whereas behaviorists will argue, well, let's get them to do the behavior so that they have the exposure, right? So that's a constant conundrum, and um, I think that's a great question. So I'll just say that I, I hear um, characterizations of CBT often as a therapist telling a client what to do. And good therapy, whether it's CBT or any other kind of therapy, should be collaborative. I never tell my clients what to do. I have discussions with them about whether doing something is a good idea for them. 
having said that, and I have to acknowledge that the science shows that there really isn't a big difference in efficacy for most problems between insight-oriented therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy. So uh, neither side should be, you know, uh, particularly um, uh, overconfident that 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 what they're doing is the is the right way to do things. And I have certainly have learned a lot from studying uh, psychoanalytic and psychodynamic therapists. Okay. Um, question from someone who asked us to ask it. How do you? Um, a panelist, please comment on a therapist avoiding favoring one parent in a high conflict divorce, and why it is so difficult to do. Is that what we're talking? Yeah. This is where relying on your gut is probably not the best way to go, which I guess we were talking about, you know, having that intuitive way to respond. When you get involved working with children with high conflict divorce, it's natural for everyone to pull for you to be on their side. And it is really important that you try the best you can. First of all, be in great supervision. But besides for that, it's really important that you try to be able to understand both parents' perspective even if a parent is acting in what seems like a detrimental way. And I, I, I want to, parents can behave, and this is true with clients, they can behave in ways that you think are not helpful, you can see are damaging to a child. And, and there is room for us to have conversations, you know, do you see the effects of this? But I think as therapists, we also need to hold, why is this parent doing this? Parents are really, I, I in my experience, have not met the parent who, even parents who don't have custody of their children at some level have love and commitment and want the best for their child. So when you meet someone who's behaving in a way, and this is not, this is often pulled for in very high conflict divorce, then you see them behaving in a way that you're like, you are undermining this child's development. Or you're feeling like, I like this kid better than you. I'm more invested in this kid's health than you are. You need to step back and say, I need to understand why this parent is behaving in this way. I just, sometimes stories are helpful. Can I share working with a parent who had lost custody of a child um, and the child came to visit and she got into an argument with the child about wearing deodorant. And so then she took the child and sprayed deodorant on them. And I'm hearing this story and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you never get to see this child. What are you doing? Like, I, it, it was so easy for me to just be like, this, this is not gonna go well. But I could hear in that story, and I'm not saying that I didn't tell her this was not helpful, but I could hear her saying, I want to take care of my kid. I want to tell my kid that I want him to be clean. That is our job, to a little bit hear what a parent's behavior is telling us about what they really want. And yes, there's room for intervention. So I think with high conflict, I know this got a little off, but with high conflict divorce, if you find that you're like, ah, mother's way better, you know, father's got a good point, really rein yourself in. Yes, there can be problems, but can I really understand both parents' perspective? Um, I don't know if the book touches on that, but that's how I would deal with it. Uh, I'd like to jump to a, a topic in the book, which is the, the um, discussion of diagnosis or diagnoses. And um, Abigail makes the point, it's not me that they're after promise. Abigail makes the point that uh, if we start throwing diagnoses around and labeling kids or adults with diagnoses, that we sort of disempower them because I have a diagnosis, so uh, you know I have an out. Um, but the truth be told is that I don't find that that's to be so black and white at all. Uh, with many, many, many people, a diagnosis is one of the greatest uh, uh, relief that they can hear in a lifetime. If I struggled with anxiety for years and years and I watched everybody else be able to perform and I couldn't perform, now I have some context to it and I understand what it is that's happening to me. I know that there's others that have that. I know there's a name to it and maybe even an approach and a path to get to healing. What are your thoughts in general about diagnosing kids, diagnosing people? Is it overused or is it helpful? 
So I don't disagree with anything that you said. At the same time, if you lay out the DSMs from DSM-1 to the current one, they are expanding exponentially, and I am concerned about that. And my concern is that we are turning normative behavior or normative variations in behavior into a diagnosis, which once, is, once it's given, you can't stuff those biscuits back in the can, and uh, there could be negative side effects for that. Um, I, I also agree with both, both pieces of what you're saying, that on the one hand, it can be really helpful and believing, and I also believe that it can be harmful and is at times overused. One of, one of the things that I find really hard in, or unfortunate in, in this profession is that we're kind of bound to give a diagnosis at onset. when it takes so long to formulate a case and kind of have a good sense of what's actually going on. So I find myself frustrated that I'm forced to give a diagnosis for insurance purposes, things like that, and then I might not actually be confident or kind of open to changing. I mean, this is like a working diagnosis. So I think that you have to be really careful with what information you're using to provide a diagnosis while knowing that it could be, you could be over-diagnosing kids, right? So you're, the example that you talked about, someone with anxiety and getting that, that diagnosis and feeling that relief, it, I find it hard for that like a four-year-old would feel that type of relief or a six-year-old, right? I can imagine a teenager, an adult feeling that kind of, oh, it's not me, there's actually a, a, a label for this. And I do think that schools are very quick to label kids as uh, impulsive and attentive, anxious, and that is really doing kids a disservice because we're not allowing for this natural skill to develop. If we're quick to medicate, quick to, listen, I'm offering it. And if you have to be really confident. I think that I'm struggling, you know, primarily with this book, with the fact that there's a dialectic here. And for some people, what's the best thing in the world since sliced bread for some people is the worst for others. And, you know, like Dr. Ortiz, you're making the point that um, uh, if we overuse and overpathologize, then everybody has a diagnosis. And, and frankly, let's think about that for a moment. What if everybody has a diagnosis? What if I'm a little ADD and you're a little spectrum-y and you're a little anxious and you're a little sad and dysthymic? How terrible would that be? But it would also enable us to uh, see the road ahead and the path ahead through a context. And so does a diagnosis have to be pathological? And can there be diagnoses that are pathological? And can everybody sort of calm down a little bit about their diagnosis and not feel either... Uh, stigmatized because they have a diagnosis or helpless because they have a diagnosis. Perhaps the plan should be that everybody can have a diagnosis and everybody can trailblaze through their diagnosis. That's one of the points that I think she actually does a good job of highlighting is that there's anxiety and then there's an anxiety disorder. So the disorder piece comes up when your anxiety is really functionally inherent. If you can't go to school as a child, can't go to school, can't make friends, can't leave your house, can't ask people for help, that could lend, like, lead itself to a disorder because you can't do the things you need to do you know, as an eight-year-old. So I think, yes, we probably all have, certainly I have levels of you know, being hyper, being attentive, being anxious, and I don't think I have that disorder because it's not functioning in my life. So I think that distinction is really important. Go ahead. Wait one second. We're going to get you the microphone. I full disclosure, I did not read the book, so I'm just going based off this conversation and a couple of podcasts I've listened to. I guess just to zoom out, and it's just really something for us to think about together. And I'm happy to hear what your thoughts are. Is who is the gatekeeper of psychotherapy? Right? Who is supposed to be doing this watch and wait recommendation when a client calls and they have no diagnoses and no dysfunction and they want support whose responsibility is it is it the therapist's responsibility to say no because you don't need it and there's a five to twenty percent chance that you'll get worse is this more sociological like we're letting the public know that there are problems is it for the parents i guess i'm just zooming out and trying to understand how you're seeing that piece specifically 
So I, I think principally we are the gatekeepers. The problem is that the contingencies are all wrong. So if you're if you're someone right, you're going to make less money if you're some if you're someone who has those views that therapy should be reserved for people who have functional impairment. And I'm not really sure what a good counterweight to that is, other than us talking about that. And that's probably never going to be as strong as the contingencies of uh, of money. So it's it's a concerning aspect of our field that much of what I view as destructive practices are immediately reinforced by the contingencies we all get. So, you know, uh, I think we're misaligned in terms of what is good for a therapist and what is good for a client, and I don't have a great solution for that. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like we're not, maybe my colleagues can speak. The people that we get in our door are people who really need help. And um, we have a wait list and there are very few people that come in. And I, I can honestly say, and I do, I have colleagues that work with me. I very much do when we reach the point, um, we don't get the financial benefit the same way. So we're not rewarded. We're, uh, I guess the agency does, but we, we have a wait list and we have people who need to come in. I don't want to get... Um, we have people who want to come in, and, and when we reach the oh, end yeah. of treatment, I cannot tell you how often parents will say, but they love coming. You know, like as if that's like a treatment goal. We just have to love it. And we have conversations, you know, with family, like, I know, but remember you came in like this, and they're doing okay. Oh, but they still don't listen all the time, you know? And yeah. we, well, they're a kid, and kids don't always listen. So I, I just haven't seen enough people coming in that don't have the need for treatment, so it's hard for me to fully buy in that we're offering treatment to people who don't need it. I also want to say we're not good in America at being preventative. Um, so we really wait till things are bad. And that's why we diagnose it, because we lean on a medical model that says, well, you have to have a diagnosis. I um, mean, I actually don't look at diagnosis as long term. I work again with children zero to five. I tell parents, this is how they're presenting right now. And this is what I'm going to diagnose them so I can build. They might grow into their brain by nine. And then this could be not relevant in ADHD diagnosis, certainly trauma. It can be very, at this time, and I really hope we're going to resume, you know, this child developing in a way that's healthy and normative. So I'm not afraid of diagnosis, but I'm seeing a lot of people, I think, that need a lot of help. Yeah, I mean, I have a tradition from my, my first supervisor after grad school that by the time people are coming to us, they're already, I think I mentioned this in my intro, by the time people are coming to us, they're already in so much pain. People aren't coming because, like, you know, what, what she called the worried wealthy. You know, they have nothing to worry about. These women who don't work as their husbands are billionaires and they have nothing to do and so all they do is worry and come for therapy. Most of the people who are coming for us are either really struggling with themselves, with their emotions and feelings of pain or with their children or some significant other. So for the most part, people are coming because they're coming because they need us. So I think there's an important distinction that she makes, which is children versus adults. I would say you're, you're right about adults, but I, I see this all the time of parents wanting to bring in their children for therapy when it's not clear what, what the problem is. One thing that I do, if we want to talk about practical solutions, with all clients, in the first session, I say to them, how will we know that we are done? And that shocks a lot of people. I'm not trying to get rid of anybody, but uh, at least a discussion of that, and then we can monitor that. And then at the end, we can decide, well, now there are some new goals that we want to work on. But if you never have that discussion, it's just so easy to keep seeing, especially the, the clients that Abigail talks about, the ones who come on time and they pay and their problems are not particularly serious. It can be a pleasure to work with those people. And it takes a lot to say to someone like that, maybe you don't need therapy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, any questions from the participants, Dr. Nuaf? Or should we? Uh, ask a question. There's a, a term, trauma-informed care. The panelists are familiar with sort of views. It says every interaction we have with our clients or even with, with colleagues should be viewed somewhat through the lens of trauma. We need to be trauma-informed and sort of cautious of triggering people their latent trauma, at least. Um, any of the panelists would like to address your thoughts on that feeling? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> we, we've got all night because this one's costing me. So please, trust me. Okay. I'm going to speak to the party. We'll probably have to. Yeah, 
What happened to you? It's not everyone is walking around with trauma, but when I meet a behavior that seems quite strange or not helpful or getting someone in trouble, instead of saying, well, that makes no sense. Why are you doing that? Don't you see you got kicked out of school five times? Or why are you yelling at the receptionist? She didn't do anything wrong. And now you look like a raging lunatic to all the people in the waiting room. Trauma-informed care tells me what happened to this person that this behavior makes sense. So I'm definitely a believer. And I do think we try really hard that when we interact with people here at OHEL, we try to look at their behavior in the context of this behavior makes sense to them somehow. And it's my job to try to understand that. And I find that having a trauma-informed lens has really, really helped. So I, I think any good therapy is trauma informed, and what, however, I I am worried about the position that if you can't explain something, it's probably a traumatic response. There are a million reasons why people do what they do, and we are often confused about why people do what they do, despite all of our training, and the thinking that the first thought should be that the person was traumatized. I'm uncomfortable. And I think that trauma is also a relative term. You know, people are, like Razel said, people are, are reacting instead of responding because of things that are going on inside of them that trigger something that has a reason that it's triggered. And so, you know, it's probably a very relative term. But to move on to the next question. School accommodation. So we have a question from the audience. By all means. I was just wondering if you maintain that not every single thing is trauma. In in when in and of course not every single thing is, but when would we change from um, saying that something isn't trauma and there's something else there, versus then saying, well, I've explored other things, and it's it and apparently it is trauma. When when would we transfer to that? Um, I, I mean, what's coming to mind is the importance of assessing and not assuming. So you really need to ask questions and evaluate and gather information before jumping to that assumption that something is trauma. I, I also think, you know, to what Dr. Keith said, just because you can't come up with another explanation doesn't mean that there's some repressed hidden trauma that or memory that we're not aware of. So assessment is so important. Yeah, we're definitely not in the business of saying PTSD and let's find the trauma. When you have PTSD, there is a trauma event and working with young children is particularly challenging because I have definitely seen things that make me stop and say, this looks kind of traumatic, but I'm not going to talk about PTSD if I don't have a traumatic event because there isn't, um, you know, that, that I think is where we fall into people seeing things that maybe aren't there. So yes, we need to have the evidence to support it. And unfortunately, there are cases where I don't ever really get that answer because these are really little kids and they can't really ever tell me what might or might not have happened. And we can still provide treatment. And it, sometimes it's really hard as clinicians to sit in a place of, I'm not sure. Um, but trauma-informed care, again, is not saying everyone has trauma. It's saying that there's room to believe that behavior makes sense. And sometimes bad things that happen to people are the reasons their behavior makes sense. And I'd love to pick up on that and ask the panelists, you know, that, that precise situation that you describe, which many play therapists could swear when they see a trauma in the therapy room, in the sand, right, in the, in the play box or the game that they're playing, they could swear that they see a trauma. And... Many children either can't articulate the trauma, don't remember the trauma, or too scared or too overwhelmed to share the trauma. And so, you know, taking into account, I personally work with children in the context of family therapy. I have parents, child, or parents, children in the room together. But when you talk about a child who cannot express or articulate the trauma, is there then room for something like, again, I'm just using child-centered play just because that's what's been on my mind, but it could be sand play, it could be other forms of play therapy that are uh, projective and expressive forms of therapy that are not 
verbal? I mean, I think it's it's like the perfect storm of a bunch of problems for for a therapist to think with high confidence they can see trauma in a child's play. Uh, I I think that's. Uh, I'm very concerned about anyone who thinks that. But, you know, it's an empirical question, so uh, it should be quite easy to test this. Um, I haven't seen studies showing this. It sort of reminds me a little bit of, um, there was, there was a, a, a treatment, non-psychological, of um, maybe someone knows what it's called, where you, like, put your hand over someone, and it's supposed to heal them. And th this high school student did... Uh, a science fair project that actually got into uh, the nature or something where she just had this box in front of people who said they could do this. And she would flip a coin and they were blindfolded and she would randomly stick her hand out from one of the two and they had their hands like this. And all they had to do was say which hand of theirs her hand was under. And they did worse than chance at, at, at this. And so, you know, there are ways to test some of these things. And I realize that this is not exactly what we're talking about, but I get concerned in a similar way when people have a high degree of confidence in their own abilities. Go ahead. Hi. Um, sorry. Um, Dr. Ortiz mentioned Scott uh, Lillianfeld's Lillian work about the variety of behaviors and how we need to reliably rely on this self-assessment. How can we as therapists assess our clients' progress and work if we can't rely on their behaviors or assessment? Well, it's not, it's not that we can't rely, but we should be skeptical for lots of reasons. Um, and so, for example, one of the 27 ways that patients appear to be doing better than they actually are is what he calls the therapist's office effect, which is that when they're in front of you, they seem like they're doing reasonably well. Uh, however, they're not so much outside of the office. And so using objective measures of improvement is one way uh, to, to test that, that theory. Um, but, you know, being skeptical is, I think, at the, at the bedrock sort of principle because we are so easily fooled for many reasons, including that our clients want to please us. And so being doubtful about some of the things that they're saying um, is just, I think, a healthy place to be as a therapist. I think also if you're trying to see if your hypothesis about behavior is on, like on point, you can test it out and see if by changing a variable, it's actually to change in the direction that you want. So for example, if you have, uh, I, one of my patients is a teenager who gets really, really angry at her parents, particularly when mom invalidates her or disagrees with her and sends these really hurtful, hurtful text messages to her mom. So one of my hypotheses is that if we can get the mom to stop invalidating her, then maybe that behavior will change, will go down. So I'm trying to test out that hypothesis. It's well going because your know, behavior is really hard. It's very hard to change to, to not invalidate your child. And this idea that changing one link on the chain could result in, in change of the actual behavior you're monitoring could give you evidence that you're, you're on track. Is that an evidence-based treatment to change one variable? I'd say it's definitely part of it. Part of it's a component of an evidence-based. It's not okay. all of DBT. Yes, he. Uh, I'm just thinking about the, the conversation about um, um, rushing to diagnose on pathologized ch uh, children and how detrimental that could be because the child is developing. Um, and it's not just a question about what we see, but also what we're telling the child who they are and the kind of identity they develop from our words and from our messages, and particularly um, adolescents and teenagers who will sometimes create an identity around you know, this diagnosis. So it's so much more detrimental.
Just one thought on that, which is that when we have sort of uh, looked at the way that therapists are instructed to talk about people, we have gotten away from labeling someone as their diagnosis. So we don't say that person is a schizophrenic anymore. We say they suffer from schizophrenia. But lay people don't have this training. And I see it all the time in my son's friends. They label themselves based on their psychiatric diagnosis. And so I, I again, get, get quite concerned about that filtering of therapy speak without the proper training into the broader culture. Do you want to share something? As far as diagnosing? What do we want? I don't know if you want to take something off. Is anybody up in the chat? I mean, my thought is that I think people want to be successful. I think teenagers don't. If a child is walking around and saying, I can't do anything because I'm depressed and I should be excused, I'm more worried. Like, I, I think children want to be successful. People want to be successful. And if they're falling back on their diagnosis, to me, it's more information about the type of treatment and less about, well, we shouldn't have diagnosed them. So that's just what comes up for me when you talk about teens using diagnosis to excuse themselves. Okay, well, we're closing in on 8.30. Uh, if anybody has any final remarks or comments, I found this to be a fabulously insightful conversation, um, sharing, showing different perspectives and different angles, and um, uh, trying to create, I guess, a middle of some of the extreme views that you know people uh, experience when talking about a triggering uh, heated topic, and especially when they themselves have experienced something that makes them either very aversive to it or very sworn to it. You know, you have some clients who swear by therapy, and then you have others who come and say they swear I'll never go to therapy again, it ruined my life. And so something like this, you know, the value of this book is really the concept of, of um, reading something extreme or hearing something extreme can help you to recollect yourself and rebalance. And so I think that, you know, that's that was the goal and purpose of tonight's conversation. I think, I hope that it served its purpose. Um, I would say, I, my mom's here in the crowd tonight and uh, on the way here I stopped off at her mom, at my grandmother, uh, who is uh, well into her 90s. And she told me, we, you know, she asked me what, I, what we're discussing tonight and I told her the topic. And she said, I wanna tell you something I taught for over 50 years. She was a teacher here in Brooklyn and Mag and David. Uh, and um, she said, no child ever left my class. She taught, I think, first grade. No child ever left my class not knowing how to read or write. Never. So we know that kids can do it. You know, one of the questions, I guess, that, that still needs to be contemplated is why is it that today's generation of parents are fragilizing the children? What's going on there? But of course, if they can't go to therapy, we'll never know. Thank you, everybody, for participating. And thank you to our great panelists. First, there's a lot of facial expression, and you could see when people disagree. Did you notice? Know it? He doesn't know anything that. He doesn't know what I am. <laughs> sure, sure. That was great. Nice work. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Say that again. Oh, you did? Oh, thanks so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Take care.